But yeah. So. Can I what just about say, you? Can I just say before I, I um uh give you guys my flavor of the week that I got McDonald's before this podcast as I always do on Saturdays after work. And they gave me a plastic straw and I've never been so happy about receiving plastic. <laughs> Cause it's not McDonald's swap to the paper straws and like, you know, I don't know, they, they just feel weird. Oh, you were counting down, but I was doing intro. Yeah, dog. I said I'll do the countdown. Oh, oh, <laughs> I get it, I get it. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Herbal, S- Herbal Synergy Podcast. I'm your host, Sinji, and with me, as always, Irby. I'm all fucked up right now. What's up, Irby? You know, the usual. Nothing too much. Living my best life. That's my bad. I misunderstood. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, I say countdown and intro. Uh, you know, I thought they went with each other. Nah, man. Yeah, that's when that when the producer be like three, two, one, action, do they start start the scene? I do the actors start the scene. I mean, do be like one, two, three, action. So like, I thought yeah. you were gonna say something after three at least. Nah, that's not me, dog. Yo, so but you yeah. said you had a flavor that um, I think you're giving it to Tower of God? Yeah, I was going to do uh, when Dorsey was trying to use instant transmission to get to BAM. I thought that was kind of funny and hilarious. Um, yeah, a little, little slight kind of DBZ and Tower of God for you. But uh, it was kind of like, you know, her instant transmission is like... Uh, it's bong bong. That's what it was called. Mm-hmm. So, bong bong. yeah. So, nice spin on it. Thought it was funny. Nice tie in. Don't mind that sometimes. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So, can I what just about say, you? Can I just say before I, I um uh give you guys my flavor of the week that I got McDonald's before this podcast as I always do on Saturdays after work. And they gave me a plastic straw, and I've never been so happy about receiving plastic. Because <laughs> McDonald's swap to the paper straws, and like, I don't know, they, they just feel weird. I've never had a, well, I haven't had McDonald's in years. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, um, flavor, I think I'm going to give it to... I don't know, man. I honestly don't really know. I mean, I could give it to ReZero for the the very last episode. But then again, I can also give it to... Yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and give it to uh, ReZero. The episode where... Uh, the last episode where brother and sister unite. My man just straight up said... I'm out to sanction. I'm about to celebrate by beating this black bitch or some shit like that. Evil something, you know, something rather. I don't know. She's not black. She's dressed in black. Yeah. Just just putting that out there. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, what do you want to start with, Herbie? Uh, you want to get into some super? Yeah, we can do some super. Um... There's not much to divulge here. Uh, Granola got his ass beat by gas. And Vegeta being the the guy who comes in second all the time, the guy that he is, um, without even any explanation, just gave Goku the rest of his energy and said, hey, don't waste it. Go do what you do. And yeah. Goku went Ultra Instinct, I believe. It's kind of hard to tell, black and white. You know, he has many hair colors now. And yeah. to keep the rest of the area from danger, he instant transmissioned them to the planet. What's that guy's name is? 
um, I forget, I forget his name. Uh, Jocko. Jocko. Some planet Jocko was on, and Jocko was like, "Oh, this is easy." And well, it's about to get a lot harder. And yeah. there, that's all there really was to that episode. It was kind of setting up Goku's fight because you know, LOL, Goku always finishes enemies. Yeah. But I have an interesting question for you, Irby. Mm-hmm. Which form do you think takes um, superior? Which form do you think is superior, Ultra Instinct or Ultra Ego? And why? Probably, probably Instinct, because uh, Goku's the main character. See that my reason was Instinct because Vegeta's whole premise, even though they gave him that form to compete with Ultra e, uh, Instinct, haha, Vegeta doesn't want to do anything the way Goku does it. Which he had no problem going Super Saiyan One and Super Saiyan Two, but we got and Super Saiyan Red, Super Saiyan Blue. And it was just like. LOL, I don't want to follow Kakarot, but we're Saiyans and pretty much have the same forms. Yeah. But I just think Vegeta's um, whole transformation is based on using damage to amplify power. Well, Goku's Ultra Instinct is based on not getting hit and... Well, really not getting hit. Yeah. So, like... Vegeta, and we've already know uh, pr- the show's already proven that Vegeta can take too much damage. So, yeah. I was just like, all right, way to give him a form to try to compete with Ultra Instinct, but doesn't really compete with Ultra Instinct. Well, you know, they got to do that because that's uh, Dragon Ball Z, so. Dragon Ball Super. Yeah, it's all the same to me. Mm. All right, do you want to talk about Boruto? Yeah, well, a couple right. other things. I had a um, oh, okay. for Super, I kind of liked how uh, uh, Gas shot out um, his his eyes. I was like, oh, shot him in the eyes. That was going to be one of my flavors. Uh, it was so. kind of brutal. I was like, ooh, yeah, shot out his eyes. Uh, and then he had that little moment with Goku. He was like, oh, why aren't you angry? And he's like, oh. I'm mad, but the anger messes up with my my form. So I thought that was notable to mention. Goku knows so, how to control, but Goku's always yeah. kind of known how to control his rage for a Saiyan. But yeah, well, part of the the whole Saiyan thing is being controlled rage, I guess you could say. But um, well, but Vegeta, he can't have any Vegeta's anger theory with that. The, yeah, Vegeta's theory in the past was anger was the key to the to the power, and like Goku's thing is, I can't be angry or. My power well, won't work. That's for Ultra Instinct, but the the, the first Saiyans thing that it's all about rage mm-hmm. for there. So the but, Ultra Instinct was different. So um, for some reason, I thought like since we're like heavily mentioning Bardock, Bardock, how do you pronounce his name? Bardock. Yeah. And Go- Goku's mentioning like, hey, I don't know anything about that. And I was like, why do I feel like? Goku's gonna gain memories at some point. He shouldn't gain memories because I, I just feel like he shouldn't, but that's me. <laughs> um, but yeah. So into Boruto. So I kind of skimmed through it just to see what was going on. So like I, I know what what happens by the end of this chapter. Yeah, and why it's it kinda, happens. It's kind of funky. So uh, Naruto runs to Boruto. Um, he, he's kind of... I think Boruto is still dead at this point. And uh, Kawaki got some main strength and the karma back. And, you know, he killed Boruto. And uh, they're like, oh, now you don't have a sacrifice for the divine tree. So Code tries to flee, but he doesn't. Kawaki shrunk the, the claw mark so, so he couldn't use them. And then Kawaki proceeds to lay a beat down on Code and it's like, I'll eliminate anyone threatening Lord Seven's life, even my bro. I, this was almost going to be my flavor of the week, but, you know, it's a notable dimension. And, uh, and he's like, what makes you think I'd let you get away anyway? So I'm like, oh, OK. And then my man Naruto is in a stupor over Boruto and Shikamaru yells at him to get a grip. He's like, you're the Hokage, remember? And uh She's like, Boruto chose this to protect the rest of us. And then Kawaki goes to kill Code, but doesn't really kill him. He pulls that little 
boy Damon out and reflected Kawaki's attack at him, knocked him out. Um, so, also in lane, talk soon. And Shikamaru's like, we should deal with Kawaki since he murdered in cold blood. And Naruto's like, I don't want to hear it. I, don't, I want to abandon him. Says that it's not his fault. He didn't do it alone. And gets spilled about his family. And Shikamaru's like, he killed your son, Boruto. And then Boruto awakens. And uh, Momoshiki saved him. And because he used uh, the remaining 18% or whatever... Momoshiki can't revive, but, uh, so... Doesn't it just essentially he, mean that, like, he, um, stalled the process? No, nah, I don't think he can, he, I don't think he can come back at all, because he had to use his own material to keep him from reviving. Because he kind of explained it to him, he's like, well, I can't come back, but, um, you, that just means you now are a full whatever, and you can still be sacrificed to the tree. So he's like, oh, that happens, but there's going to be more stuff coming on, so. Okay, so Boruto won't ever get taken over. Hey, I might I might start reading again soon. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's it's interesting now. It's I, def, way better reading it versus what well, Definitely watching better it. watching it. But, like, it's those moments, like, when Naruto said bye to Kuruma. Like, you, you should watch those episodes. Nah, that's too sad. I don't want to cry. <laughs> oh my god. But yeah. So I guess um I'll go into jujutsu now. So uh, uh jujutsu, short and sweet. I'm like fucking Chojin. Yeah, yeah I forty five chapters are fucking nothing. Yeah. Um so this one, so Yuta notices he's being watched by a couple high-level sorcerers. We find out Yuta can use positive energy from reverse, uh, reverse positive yeah. energy. Yeah, uh, from reverse control technique to dispel a cursed spirit. And there's this little cockroach thing that he's fighting, and Yuta's on the ropes, and he's like, "I don't want to use my cursed technique, to, uh, positive energy to. He doesn't. I don't want to reveal it." But he ends up kissing the cockroach to kill it, and he gained five points. Fuck it, he ended up kissing it. <laughs> yeah, it was the quickest way, and the lady pops down. She's like, oh, I see you know how to use um, reverse flow positive energy technique. So I'm like, oh, okay. She better move oh. real quick. That's sort of about to come spinning. Yeah. So, um, that was yeah, bad. nothing too much there. Yeah. So Got she- that done. Which are you more excited about talking, um, Tower of God or My Senpai is Annoying? Tower of God or My Senpai is Annoying. Let's see. Ah, they're, they're equally. I feel like uh, Senpai is a little quicker to talk about. All right, let's go through Senpai then. Yeah, so let's see. Let me scroll through my notes here. Take your time. Um, episode four, Igarashi yes. gets a cold and a fever, which was a little confusing to me. I'm like, you can have both. I, mean, I guess it's not. Yeah. So, um, so Crazy she's out though. sick. <laughs> yeah. Is she? Uh... I forgot to mention this last week. Um, I think episode three was my favorite episode and will be my favorite episode because all those kids with the one girl that was missing a scarf, the lost her scarf. Yeah, they were all wearing straw hats with red uh, bands on. I was like, "Oh, we got a bunch of Luffy fans here." Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So she sent out a, a a text message to the group chat, but uh, Takeda doesn't get it because she has a old Nokia phone. So Igawashi, she's like jumping down the rabbit hole. She thinks she's gonna die. She's like, "What if I I, I die? No one knows." And da da da. So, um. So then she's like, there's no food in the house. So she goes to leave, and Takaba shows up just as she's about to leave. And she's just like, he, he has food and stuff. And she's like, wait, can you cook for me? And uh, so he cooks food, and and she Makes eats it. Udon. Yeah, udon. And later on, she's kind of embarrassed about the state of her place. I'm like, why, girl? You, you got a fever and sick. Everyone knows. 
and uh, Tagpa says something about she had quite the fever, and they, you know, they leave and whatever. Um, so, and then he leaves and tells her, I should get a smartphone. And, and she's like, yeah, I can help you on the next day off. And they go cell phone shopping. And this part was funny, too. The clerk says, so, you're shopping with your daughter? <laughs> yeah. How about how my man spent, like, all night just trying to send a thank you text? Yeah, he's really computer illiterate or phone illiterate. So, so then, uh, not to me calls, calls Igawashi and she starts chiding her and she's like, well, I saw you someday with a big old burly man. And the next day Takada gets a cold. And so the reverse thing happens. She shows up with him for food and she cooks for him. And the oven mitts, I thought this was another funny part. She was like, she called a strikeout a home run, which is kind of funny. She was like, home run. Because she's like, these are like baseball mitts in her mind. And let's see. So then she feeds him and he tells her she would make a great partner for someone one day. And Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, man, you don't get the hint. So then we find out Takeda gets his cold from standing under a waterfall for his training, which is crazy. And this was the other part that was funny, too, how she she touches his face and was like, oh, you're so scraggly. And she, like, screams and he wakes up and he's like, what are you doing? And then she judo chops on the, on the back of the neck and then leaves. So I was <laughs> I was thinking, I was just like, okay, because, like, obviously the show points at the love interest in the office. But Igarashi and Takeda are, like, completely inc- uh, compatible when it comes to, like, sizes. Like, she barely reaches his kneecaps. How are those two supposed to have an intimate relationship? Size don't matter, dog. Bruh, he will break her. He might. He might not. You never know. She would have to pray that, like, all his size went to the rest of him. Maybe. I don't know. But anyhow. I'm just saying, that's like a football player, a football linebacker and a midget. Sometimes it happens that way. Mm. Sometimes it doesn't. But anyhow, um, so the next episode is Valentine's Day Sympathy. And Natsumi and Igawashi go to a movie and she's kind of glowing because some little kid uh, called them both ladies because they got lost. She's like, I'm lost. I don't know where to go. And she's like, thank you, ladies. Yeah, and Igarashi was <laughs> feeling herself. Like, yeah, someone saw me as a woman. Yeah. So then we find out that uh, Shaku, uh, Sakurai is going to make chocolate for the whole office. And Igarashi is looking for Takeda, who's out on a conference call. And the chief calls him, and she's like, oh, you just leave the office. And then he's like, oh, that means she's going home, too. So he ended up inviting Igawashi out to dinner. And I'm See, like, oh, That snap. was interesting that he thought about her. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It could just be like a friend thing. Like, hey, I'm in the area. Want to get some dinner? Listen, yeah, motherfucker, sure. this is a show you pick. You might as well support them. Shoot. You don't know. I just be looking. Um, so anyhow, uh, so she agrees and she's just like she just runs out of She's like, Oh, I'm going out, I'm leaving now, bye. And, and she's just like, Yeah, girl, get it. Yeah. And then so the little boy from earlier is being accosted by two villains and Takada saves him, and it turns out it's Shakurai's little brother. And Takeda's like, oh, hey, y'all want to get some ramen with us? And Sakurai's like, nope, we're, we're, we got something else to do. Goodbye. And so then they go to the place, and we found out his first name is Hurami. And he's always uh, there eating there. And the, the ramen shop owner is pretty, pretty cool, too. He was talking about his Valentine's Day special, which is like chocolate noodles. He, and his motto's like, oh, he's pushing the envelope. So I kind of respect that. And we find out Takeda or Takeda isn't much for the sweets. And 
Then my man Kazuma, he had it down bad. I was, I was like, man, my man going through it because he didn't seen. He saw an old girl with with yeah. her, her brother, but her brother was standing on Yo, a ledge, so he looked was super tall. Mentally fucked for the yes. next twenty four hours. Yeah. Like, He's floored, speechless, couldn't even... I was like, damn, my man really going through it right now. Overpouring drinks, not playing games, just laying in bed thinking, um, probably overpouring the coffee. I don't remember what he was doing at work, but at some point he was just continuously pressing the buttons for machines for drinks to come out of the vending machine. I'm like, there's no way you put that much change in the machine. What are you doing? You broke it. it yeah, it might be one of those ones where, like, it, you just have like an account set up and then you can just keep ordering as long as there's money in your account because we have one of those in my work. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, so he did that. And chocolates are in the office. They get, they're giving out and because then we're still in the days. Um, so Suko took, he took his chocolate and he confronts her and she sh- shoves her homemade chocolate with vodka down his throat. I thought that was funny, too, because I'm like, it kind of led me to believe because she was like, oh, I like water. So now I'm thinking about that, that vodka water bottle. Was that really water or was that really vodka? So I don't know. I don't know, man. She a little different. She is real different. So Takeda is back and he has chocolate and Igarashi thinks it might be Heart full of chocolate, and she's kind of concerned. And he tells us from a client's wife, and he gives her, she gives him her homemade chocolate, and he he likes it. So then, we flash to Sakurai, she goes to check on K- uh, Kazuma, and she gives him chocolate, and he's like, "Oh, I'm pretty sure this is a Curtis kind." And she's like, "It's the thought that counts. I know I can't make homemade chocolate, but it's still chocolate." And he's like. He's like, well, I just saw you with that guy. He's like, oh, you mean my brother? It looks like someone got the wrong idea. <laughs> and so they, they end up, like, I guess, clearing the air there. And then Igarashi, she goes and hands Kazuma a report, and he's like, oh, this is the most I've ever seen him smile. And old girl changes the, the situation with the quickness. <laughs> so... She's like, oh, yeah, well, this, that, and the other. Uh, So she changed the subject. And next one, Grandpa Hearts Igawashi. (laughs) Starts off with a text from Grandpa about dolls, and Sakurai wants to send him a a picture, and then sends him, like, a feudal picture, and Grandpa is mad. So you didn't tell me you was dating some lug? And... No, he came over immediately. Yes. And then so uh, we find out that it's Iguashi's and Takada's birthday. They share the same birthday, which is weird. Uh, well, what's so really they, weird is that they didn't notice already, considering she's been there for a year already. I thought she was there for two. Yeah, it's just like, so like this is her. No, well, she's been there for a year already. This is her second year. Okay, yeah. But, um... I mean, sometimes you don't you don't really know. I I, I myself don't go around advertising um, when my birthday is. So. So then they agree to get gifts for each other, and then Grandpa shows up at the store, and then they have some words. And then they go out drinking, and Gramps asks her if they're dating, and she's like, "Nah, whatever." She's like, "Oh, do do do." So then Grandpa goes sees a movie. And then this movie gives him like a whole revelation about stuff. And he's like, he, he texts her, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes fishing and Takada's there. So then they go on like a whole, I got to outfish you. And it turns into that uh, male ego driven conquest of stuff. So, so that happens and it's like a, they go to bat and cage and they they do their and they just continue and then we they end up making amends and we find out that she's twenty three. Yep. 
I thought she was like yeah. 19, but I like then I thought about it. I was like, oh yeah, college. Yeah, so. Yeah, so. Then I thought this was another interesting part. She can't put eye drops in her own eyes. <laughs> so she gets talking to the helper. He's like, you really ought to learn how to do that for yourself. Oh, and so I, also, then, I also noted that I think Grandpa's uh, voice actor is Blackbeard. Yeah, well, on um, in the dub version, it's uh, Grandpa from Kenichi. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, in the sub version, it's I believe it's Blackbeard because the laugh you you can tell from the laugh. Yeah. Um. Uh-huh. I I I will talk about ReZero, switch things up a, a little bit. Oh, I wasn't wasn't all the way done yet. No. Yeah, cause uh, later on they go and they're going all getting dinner and uh, Igawashi getting picked on by some people and then Grandpa and Takeda comes in and handles them. So that was it. Last little blurb. Yeah, that little. So that little that little bit of five minutes. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. All right. And we move on to ReZero, and then Irby can end us off with some T.O.G. Mm. Sure will. Mm. Okay. The Permafrost of Elior Forest. And in this episode, Amelia is talking to Pandora, and Pandora is guaranteeing Amelia. They're like, hey, you open this door, I'll go. No problems. No smoke. And I'm like, yo, is she telling the truth? She could be telling the truth, but she's a witch. Can't really trust her. And then we find trust out nobody. Amelia, if she imagines the key, the key shows up. But only Amelia can do that because she is the chosen one for the door. And then Pandora is like, you have two paths ahead of you. One where you keep your promise and try to get what you want. And it's very difficult. The other one, you break your promise and... You can safely be assured that I go away. Everyone lives. Yeah. Well, Terrible. Amelia decided to keep her promise. And Fortuna shows up and it starts attacking the witch. And um, uh, Pandora is like, you, dirt, you certainly are her mother. And Fortuna is like, I'm not her mom. I can never be her, uh, her great parents. My brother and his wife entrusted her to me. I'm just like, I don't really, I still don't get the whole mother thing, but okay. And then, like, found the witch was just toying with Fortuna mentally, and Goose, uh, Battle Goose showed up, and, like, he was such enraged that, like, he thought Fortuna was Pandora and ended up stabbing her with unseen hands. And I don't he, think he's, I don't think he saw her as Pandora. I think she, she like projected herself as, as um, Pandora or F- Fortuna, you know, probably because she did that. She, or because earlier she made um, made Amelia look like her, and Fortuna smacked her. So that could that's have been what a little I, foreshadowing to what was about to happen later. Yeah, that's. I think that what may have happened. I don't know. It's highly likely. It's possible, but not improbable. So correct. Yeah, I thought it was just worth mentioning. So, um, Battle Goose realizes that he ended up, you know, hitting Fortuna, which dealt her a very fatal wound. And Fortuna is trying to tell Amelia goodbye. And Amelia kind of sucks it up to try to ease Fortuna's pain. And Fortuna is just like telling Amelia that she's proud of her, blah, blah, blah. And that. She'll always love her, and she calls her Millie again. I'm like, come on, man. It's Puck has to be Fortuna, I think. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. And then um, once, um, once Fortuna dies, Pandora is like, well, now that she's dead, you can make the other choice. And Millie is like, what do you mean? I'm like, well... You were keeping your promise, but now that she's dead, there's no real point of keeping a promise, so go ahead and open the door. And then Mealy, little Mealy just went nuts and just kept saying die. And like, boom, yeah. ice. 
And then she's like, whoa, unexpected. Die. Boom. Eyes. What are you doing? Boom. Die. Eyes. And he's like, oh, okay. I can tell you're in a bad headspace right now, and I'm not going to get what I want. So I'm going to go. And Amelia started freezing the whole forest and freezing herself. So we find out Amelia is the reason the forest froze over. Yeah. And um, Pandora basically tells Battle Goose, hey, let's go. Every What you did was for love. And, like, Battle Goose kind of, like, loses his mind. And he's like, yes, love, 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 love. And then he starts laughing. I'm like, so this is when Battle Goose actually laughed. Okay, a little error in the titles of the episodes, but all right. Yeah. Um. So then we go and... Uh, we find uh, Kidna is asking Amelia, was like, hey, we'll see everything you did could have been avoided. And Amelia's like, I have no regrets. Didn't you see what Fortuna said? Mother Fortuna said, like, she was proud of me for keeping my secret, uh, keeping my promise. Yeah. So we go back over to Subaru and the others, and they're basically deciding how they're going to split up and. Rom throws a diss at Garf and Otto, and Otto was about to complain, but it seemed like... Did they cut off for you? Um, I don't think so. Like, Otto was like, oh, come on, that's not... And then they were just walking. I, I think it did. Or he cut something short. I don't know. Okay, so they go over to Roswell's, um, where Roswell's at, and he's fully dressed in paint again. And we find that Otto actually left quite the impression on Roswald. And Subaru went there to get Roswald to surrender. So, next episode. The beginning of the sanctuary and the beginning of the end. I'm actually going to steamroll this episode. Or at least the flashback. So, Echidna meets Roswald and Roswald's suffering from like magic deficiency or something like he's overflowing with magic and Echidna slips him the old tongue to like suck out the excess energy and yeah. they kind of that's how, when they kind of became like a band of four so it was Beto Goose, uh, not Beto Goose, I'm sorry Roswald, Betty uh, Ryuzu and Echidna and they were just kind of their own little crew um, Roswald and Echidna and presumably uh, Betty were, or Ryuzu too, they were all working on putting a barrier around the sanctuary to keep, um, what's the, what's the guy's name? Hector, the devil of melancholy away. Yeah. And they were running out of time. So running out of time. They decided, that's how Ryuzu decided that she would be the core and that's why she's in that crystal in the the present and Subaru is telling Roswell all this in hopes that he will surrender but Roswell's like what's that got to do with anything and he's like can't you uh see that like people are not as weak as you think he's like, no people are all weak and this is why I can't fold because weak uh, feelings are weak emotion or weakness. Feelings are a weakness. And I wasn't really understanding what Roswell was trying to do, but what I did get out of this was that Roswell has been alive for four hundred years. Yes. And that does make that makes no sense to me. I get why Betty's alive for four hundred years. She's a spirit. Reuses alive for four hundred years because she was created and she's frozen in a crystal. Echidna is I don't know if she's alive but she's a witch she's so. a witch so I don't know what Roswell's deal is mm, I don't know either but um, Ryuzu was the first person Betty lost and yeah. like Betty really cared about Ryuzu and was not okay with this plan um, Roswell after we go back to the present tries to smooth talk Garf back to being against Subaru but Garf is like, nah, I write up back the guy who said he believed in my strength than the guy who betted on my weakness. Yeah, for me to stay weak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, Amelia finishes crying in the, the ruins or whatever it's called. 
And that's the end of that. So we go to the next episode titled Reunions of Roars. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's an yeah. interesting title. Okay. I mean, you know, it's kind of evident. All right, so Garf said he'd go to the mansion, and Garf has bracelets or something to boost his power. He says, I'm already as strong as around, but with those, I'm even stronger. And then, apparently, Reinhardt has a saying about himself. Uh, did you catch the saying? Because I missed it and forgot to go back. What? Uh, no. There was a saying with Reinhardt's name. Do you remember Reinhardt? No. The guy from like um, season one that say yeah the, the night yeah. I remember him but I I don't remember the saying. Yeah, it was something to like he put people's minds at ease and Subaru was like that guy is still alive and he already has a saying about him. Yeah. And so so um so we're going back to the mansion. Um, Rom had to reassure Amelia that Subaru or Subaru cares about her because Amelia came out and she was like. Do you think Subaru meant um, that he loved me? Do you think he meant it genuinely? And Rom's just like, I can't answer to that, but I can assure you he cares deeply about you. And then Rom explains what they were doing, and Amelia's like, I have to be strong. And uh, Rom actually acknowledged, acknowledges Amelia's strength and tells her, like, this would be the first time that I bow my head to you and genuinely thought highly of you and i'm sorry for that so then rom now trusting i guess to look in amelia's eyes asks amelia to save roswell because he's become delusional from the witch and amelia just being the person she is is like you've been there all along how could i say no even though i'm not really sure what's what's going on yeah. And my boy Roswell shows up and tries to sweet talk Amelia to go against Subaru. And it's like, nah, Subaru is not using me for his own will. Subaru is just Subaru because Subaru cares about me no matter yeah. what. He even tells me the bad stuff I do too. Yeah, he's, he was even hard on me when I, I needed him to be hard on me. And then he always supports me. So now I'm going to show you. So Amelia... She went back into the the room, right? She went right back. She went straight back in there to do the second trial, didn't she? I think she did. Yeah. Yeah, and then we we flash forward to Roswell tells Rom to stay there. Uh, no motherfucker. Rom goes and follows Roswell to Ryuzu's uh, crystal crystallized Ryuzu, and Rom's basically like. Your life is mine for the taking, but this is not how I want to take it. So Roswell reveals that he's the one that attacked Rom and Rem's hometown, and that's the reason Rom lost his horn, uh, her horn, which really confused me. I was like, so if Rom knows this and Roswell knows that she knows this, is their entire relationship just based on her one day going to kill him? I have no idea, but I was like, he's like, yeah, you pledged fuel to, to me because I'd stop your rampage or whatever um, she was going through. And so huh? I was like, oh, well, that's awfully nice. I guess. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of weird, but continue. Yeah, so, and then Roswell was talking about, like, die by the thing you live by. If you live by the sword, die by the sword. If you live by magic, die by magic. If... You make a deal with a devil, die by that devil. And like so that's when he reveals the the twins thing and he decides and we find out that he actually uses the crystal because I thought he was gonna free Ryuzu. Now that like so mm. much has changed. But then we find out he's been using the crystal Ryuzu's in to summon the snow that brings out the great rabbit. Yeah. And mm, mm, mm. Rom's like, Oh, I'm not alone and my boy Puck comes out. And I'm yeah, like, what like, the Puck. fuck? <laughs> I was like, Puck's here. You're everywhere but with Amelia. What the fuck is going on, my dude? Yeah. And the attack on the mansion is on. Federica is fighting red hair assassin lady, because I forget her name. Petra is looking for Betty. 
Petra Alex Subaru's I guess for, Elsa. It could um, be Elsa. Is, yeah. Um, but Petra like is starting to lose faith and like just calls out for Subaru who turns out behind him. It's like it's like, are you gonna go up there? It's like, nah, bro. If I go up there, I'm dying quick. But I got I got backup. We cool. And then Garth yeah. comes in to save his big sis who's big sis and he's like, Should I be calling you big bro? And she slaps him. <laughs> I thought that was a funny touch too. <laughs> it's like big bro. And then he's yeah. like, but you got to beat it, sis. I'm going to need to focus if I'm going to um, beat the bitch in black. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, all right. I have less questions than I usually have, but I still have questions. And I need the next three episodes to get answers. But I'm, I'm good for now. Yeah, I was like, oh, man. Just big bro, that boy made me laugh. I was like, Haha, big bro. So, mm -mm. Oh, yeah, man. good, good episode, good chapter. I was like, Puck, Puck's back. They were good. It's like, yay for Puck. So now that I feel like, I feel like Puck, maybe Puck is, does that make him either a free spirit or like, is he contracted to Subaru now? I have many questions about Puck's uh, involvement in all this. I feel like Puck just... Because he broke his contract like the, with Amelia, but he's still around. Does that mean he has a contract with someone else now? Maybe maybe he doesn't need a contract. Maybe he can just do what he wants to do. Yeah. But like the contract with Amelia helped bolster her powers or something. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. We'll see. We will. So, yeah. Good times. A little T O G, my dude. Yes, some Tower of God. So, Tower of God, season two, episodes two sixty two to two sixty nine. Uh, so, we get here, and Yuri tells the door she stopped beating on Rachel. Bam shows up to check on Rachel. Orion is talking to someone and, and says, "Tell." Mado Rico, if he wants to make a deal, wait till after we get off the train. And she will do as the elders say. So Evan overhears her and she asks why she doesn't want to go to the hidden floor of Bam. And she at, and he asks her, does she know what's on the floor? And she's like, the evil sleeping that Jihad left there after becoming a god. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's going to get interesting. So then the group meets up in the parts, and they just decide to split into two teams, uh, into two groups. Uh, Yuri takes Khan and Dorsey to fight the big monsters that will spawn all, going to the floor, and everyone else deals with the little monsters. And they attack together in a group, and Rachel gets attacked, and her monster protects her. Khan's group defeats the boss monster and the hidden entrance room uh, of the past opens up but it isn't actually open and and then um, Wang Nan is being told uh, by Karaka to uh, summon Viol and he doesn't want to do it so Karaka threatens to kill Missing and Wang Nan notices the ring on his finger and asks to talk, talk to him alone for a minute but he doesn't uh, Wang Nan tells him he has one like his ring, and then we flash to Hockney, and Hockney wants to talk to Bam about Rachel, tells her he has a strange feeling about Rachel, and he feels the energy of death, and the Bam's like, okay, well, we'll just keep an eye on her. So then Karaka stopped crushing them to talk to Wang Nan, and Wang Nan tells him he has the same ring, and it's, and it's from the red light district. Also, that he has no recollection of that certain place, and Wang Nan was raised by a nanny. He didn't know his parents. The ring she gave him was a token of being a prince. She dies one day and tells Wang Nan she's sorry for not raising the king's seed as well as she should have. And my man Wang Nan thought that she loved him, but she was just doing the job. Uh, so then an acquaintance of hers came by and told him that the ring was an important key for him to climb the tower. He said, if you ever meet someone with the ring, only ask him to confirm it. And Wayne asks him about the red light district and why they 
uh, share parts of the same key. He asked Karaka. And Karaka asked Ryan and Sean to ring if he wants to know the truth. And he's like, I can't. Rachel has it. The door opens. Bam and company confronts Karaka. Uh, Yura thinks Rachel's come to save her. I'm like, what a joke. Rachel didn't come to save you. So, so Bam goes to save Missing and Karaka attacks. And then the master key activates and all the stuff starts turning loose. So it happens. Uh, the door starts to open. They all get sucked in. They go unconscious. Bam wakes up alone and gets attacked by some creatures. Kun defends the other. Rachel is also separated. And Hockney is kind of sick from being there. And then, and Dorsey, she's like, I gotta get to Bam. And then this is where she uses her instant transmission to get to Bam. And she ends up going to Kun. <laughs> and they all fall. And Rachel and Yuriha encounter a scale whose job it is to show yourselves equally. They call it a scale of the past. And they generate uh, the place where you need to go as well as your sworn enemy and uh, King's Cradle. Bam doesn't have a past, which is, she's like, oh, this doesn't compute. So Bam is under quarantine. And I have to say, I think Endorsey comes to save him. And you get a little bit of Jihad backstory he knew he was going to become a guy like King, so he saw the place where he could leave his half-human self behind uh, on a train. And he received a mirror of the past as a, a gift from some person. And well, I forget the guy's name that gave him the gift. But it, once you gaze upon the mirror, it, it stores your current self. And he stored it in the last compartment of the train, so you must clear the whole train to get to it. And then you find out later that they live in the mirror and the spell of oblivion is cast on the room. So you can't mention it or else everything goes away. So no recollection of it. And there's only, we find out there's only two keys to open up the room. Jihad has them and the train administrator should have them. But somehow my boy Bam has the key. So, huh, interesting. Is Bam the train conductor? Who knows? Bam just OP. That's what Bam is. Yeah, I know. I was making a little joke. So then, kind of Hockney fall to Rack, and the snake eats him. And Rack's like, I got to go save them. And then my man Rack immediately proceeds to get eaten. And someone saves Bam and endorses for being crushed. And it's Ho Sung Yu. And he's like, I was waiting a long time for them to show up. And then Rack and Kun talk. Kun wonders if there's more than one way to get to the hidden floor because he's like, how did Rack get here? He didn't go this way. And Rack's like, I, I miss, miss Black Turtle. Bam. So, <laughs> And then, then my man Rack came up with an idea to attack from the inside of the little snake person. And he makes him spit it out. And my man Hockney drew a picture of Rack and is protecting it from water damage. I thought that was funny. Because Heidi's like, oh, it's a talking crocodile. <laughs> and then so the medium, the wand and mistral, uh, leads him to the place. And Hockney wishes the turtle safe passage. The turtle's like, so he wishes safe passage to see. And the turtle's like, I live in an apartment, bro. What are you talking about? <laughs> Which was hilarious. So... Find out that most people get summoned to the town and not the door. So for whatever reason, cunning them ended up there. And everything there is composed of data. And you might run into your sworn enemy. And a person is generated for each one that uh, looks at themselves in the mirror. Most of the time, it's, just, it's a powerful enemy or a rival you wanted to defeat. And Rack's enemy is that monster that they face, the snake. And Hung Sung, you guess that... Uh, that they were there to see the young jihad and wants to help them. And we find out that there are specific conditions for leaving. And sometimes the person you see is yourself, uh, is your sworn enemy. So, And you have to eliminate your sworn enemy to maintain balance on the floor. So it will come back through at some point. You might have to fight, depending on how good or evil you are. And your sworn enemy instinctively knows where you are on the floor at all times. 
And you could sense he swarmed the enemy as soon as he seen him. And then Bam's like, what is that? He's like, oh, what's that over there? And then he gets a feeling, and then V.O. shows up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, look at V.O. here. And Kun sees Flash of Kun's group, and you see a place called The Fruit of Good and Evil. It's comprised of people in quarantine for for evil and dangerous deeds or people that upset the balance of the floor. And I'm like, oh, that's where Bam is. I didn't even have to know. And they have to clear stages to progress. They have a good and evil monitor in their pocket. It monitors and sends your sworn enemy after you. Uh, if it goes too far evil. And so Bam starts fighting himself. And Hung Young Chu had a whole trap waiting to stop the old. And Bam saves him. Like, come on, Bam. Just let the man die. I don't know why you did that. So... Bam, bing, bam, says him. Bam asks Vio why they must fight. And he's like, can't we just work together? And he's like, no, catch these hands. And so he says, I will kill you. So they, they fight, they exchange blows. Bam doesn't want to kill himself. A, a new giant soldier appears. Ho Sung Yu says they should flee. And then a person shoots Vio in the neck with a tranquilizer dart. And refers to Bam as, is that the hero we're waiting for to free us from this place? And that Damn man's right. name, yeah, that man's name is Batis. So, Kun ends up meeting up with Sachi and Boro, supposedly. They're the heroes that will save them from the evil. And evil isolated in the fruit of good and evil. Uh, so, D is the head of the village. Kun feels that this is a requirement for the first stage, that they have to do all these missions. And requests are re re required to receive good D points. They change clothes and start the quest. And then we flash to Bam and Bodice. It says Bam must be a, a threat if they summon the captain of the guard. They arrive at the, the shelter. Bodice says they have to escape before the heroes complete their quests. Bodice was a former wandering minstrel, which is, you know, interesting. And we find out that the big breeders are the administrators, like rankers. And then one day, Badis saw the truth, and that made him lead astray from the, the, the big breeders. And what he saw was they were beating up a random citizen one day, and then erased his memories again and beat up, and the citizen began to immediately praise the people who were just beating him. So Badis created a song to expose the truth, and... The more and more the townspeople listen, the more and more their, their, their memories return. And soldiers were sent to destroy towns and reset memories. And then they trapped them in the fruit and they cut open his mouth like the Joker. So he could not sing any longer. Then they curse his daughter so she could never learn to speak. I'm like, that's unforgivable. Yeah, that's And sucks. a breeders, yeah, breeders can adjust data. And so we flash to Kun's group, and Rack says he doesn't like that sneaky look on Kun's face, and it makes him nervous. And the big breeder is the person that watches over the mirror, Jahaz's lapdog. So I thought it was already ominous to mention that Vio was shot with Badis, uh tranquilizing dark, and he's like, oh, he won't wake up for a few days. I'm like, oh, every time you say he won't wake up for a few days, he's they waking up in a too. few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, so so that happens. Uh, yeah. And then they are located in, in the seeds where they're allegedly safe and no soldiers can enter. And then they speak at the exit found, and it takes about a day. And they say, bam, can break through. Oh, young Sue says it would take about a week for them to clear. And he's like, a genius can take two days to complete. And Bam's like, oh, we got to get there in a hurry. It'd be two days because he knows Kun's on the on the scene. <laughs> and so Flash the Kun's group, they completed a C-rank mission, and they fought an octopus. Like, Kun, he went from doing, like, what, I think it was D or E-ranked, and he's like, oh, let's just do this one. Let's get this, hurry up and get this over with. Yeah. Yeah, so I was like, mm. And so Kun uses his bear to fight an octopus, but it's not a full power because Beta isn't there. And I find it funny because the big breeder's like, oh, 
his thing can handle that. But it's like, I'll adjust the power input so that he can't handle it. And so I'm like, ooh, okay. And so I end up destroying Kun's lighthouse. And then VO wakes up and they get attacked by soldiers. And Bam uses his his thorn to stop VO. And so he's like, that's enough of that. And that's where I ended. All for Tower of God. Oh, it's getting good, Irby. Yeah, it's, it's getting real good. All right. I, do you I'm have anything um, you want to note about it? Nah, nah. Sometimes Bam just does crazy things. I'm like, Bam, you should just let him kill the guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, guys, that's going to do it for this week's installment of Herbal Synergy. Uh, I had something to say. I just dropped it. But, hey, man, like, comment. I hope you enjoyed. And we'll catch you next week. Peace. Peace.